Devin Booker was the clear weak link in game one against the Minnesota Timberwolves. Five of 16 from the field, not the Devin Booker we are used to seeing. On today's episode of Locked On Suns, what happened? Will it continue? And what can we expect in game two? Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, writer at Dime Magazine, and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on this Monday. Little break before game two, so one more pod between now and then, but thank you for being here. Thank you for finding us wherever you listen to podcasts. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube, so just hit that follow button, hit that subscribe button wherever you're finding us. Get a new episode in your feed every single Monday through Friday. Become an everydayer and get locked on to the Phoenix Suns all playoffs long and beyond. Today's show brought to you guys by the Game Time app, the best place to buy a ticket. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. We'll have more from Game Time later on in the show. But joining us as he does every single Monday is Brandon Duane. Yes, he is a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun, and we are going to start with Devin Booker. Then we'll look forward a little bit to Game Two. But why do you think, if you were to come up with one key reason, Brandon, that Book had such an off night in game one on the offensive end? Honestly, I think you got to credit Minnesota's game plan defensively. They they put their best two defenders on Beal and Book and pretty much said, Katie, go to work. And, uh, you know, it it definitely worked in Minnesota's favor in terms of just getting Book off to a a slow start and – so look, sometimes he'll hit those tough shots with McDaniels in his face or, or you know, Nikhil, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. It doesn't matter who it is. Like, he's shown he can't hit shots over tough defenders. But when he gets in those slumps, it just kind of – we've seen it, like, snowball. And, unfortunately, that's just what happened in game one. Yeah. I mean, look, it, do, it shouldn't surprise anybody from a Sun standpoint who's been watching. I mean, we've all watched Book his whole career, right? Like – this type of defender is kind of his worst nightmare. And that's not, doesn't mean he'll, he'll be this bad the whole series. It doesn't mean that he won't have an adjustment. Maybe they'll find ways to get McDaniels off of him. I don't know. But that that's not a shock to me that this would happen because of McDaniels' combination of athleticism and length and strength. He blocked him twice at the basket. He blew up a bunch of plays before they even began. He contested a bunch of stuff from behind. Like, this is kind of the type of guy that's given book problems forever, and he's going to have to figure it out. Um, I will say, on on one... Well, I'll, I'll save that, actually. Interesting point on him, though. His first shot and two of his first three shots, Brandon, were both pull-up threes. And on the one hand, I think he is going to have to take that shot in this series against a defender like that and against the way that Minnesota's bigs will, will play defense in the pick-and-roll and everything. But at the same time, I do think it could have gotten him off to a weird start from a rhythm standpoint to to just not get an easy one to go down, not get to the basket or transition or a kind of open midi or something like that, but to be gunning from a place on the court that he doesn't always shoot. I think he might come out in game two and just say, hey, let me let me just get a floater off the glass or something. Like, let me just get to my spot and they'll build something in from a game plan standpoint to get him there. Yeah, that's, that's the best way to get out of a slump, right, is attack the rim, uh, make something happen, get to the free throw line, see a couple free throws drop in, and, and go from there instead of settling for, for the, the tough jumpers. So I think that's one adjustment I think he can make, just getting downhill as much as possible, like him and Beal both. Like I think that's one thing they really lacked, and obviously that's yeah. part of what makes Minnesota such a, a tough defensive team is because they don't really – allow those holes or gaps in the defense but when whenever it's there they got to attack it and it has to be quick uh because as we all know phoenix's offense is at its best when the ball is snapping and moving and there, there's very little of that offensively and it was just kind of the ball was getting stuck on one side of the floor or minnesota really kind of dictated the, the entire tempo of it so book needs to just get back in that mode where he, has, he puts his head down gets to the rim and then from there, you build that rhythm, and then you know he sees a midi fall, and then a pull-up three falls. So it just kind of like stacks 
based off his confidence. So I'm not too worried about Book. I think he'll he'll figure it out in game two. Uh, if he doesn't, I'd be a little concerned yeah. long term. But to me, it's just it's just one of those games. So last year, game one of the first round, the Suns lost. If if people remember, obviously Kawhi played against the Clippers, but Book was relatively quiet in that game. Not nearly this bad. Um, 26 points, 10 of 19 from the field, didn't make a three, only three assists. And then obviously that was pretty much his last bad, uh, last even mediocre game up until game six when they got killed by Denver. Um, so we've, it's not to say five of 16 is, is par for the course in a game one, 2022 game one of the Dallas series that obviously we, we know how it ended, but they won that game. Book was 7 of 20. So, you know, it's not exactly as if this guy's flying. The thing I would say, though, is he has eliminated as part of these weird games that he has. He doesn't turn it over anymore. Like, it used to be both. Like, he used to get cold and cough the ball up. At least he's not doing that anymore. And I think that's part of why, even as he was struggling in that first half, the Suns were still keep it, able to keep it close. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Because that's when you're killing the team with... If it's just the shots not falling, you could live with that. But if you're you're turning it over on top of it, and uh, you know just letting the the physicality get the best of you, then then that's far more concerning and damaging to the team. So the fact he's able to limit that and and still, um, I thought defensively he showed some some pretty hard nosed effort for the most part. Obviously the, the team had some lapses defensively as a whole, and you know just schematically there's there's some issues. I think Minnesota did a great, did a great job of attacking, but. Uh, overall, I think, you know, book, it's just like you said, there's, there's going to be games like this every once in a while, as long as it's, uh, they, they cannot repeat that that's for sure. Especially in a game that yeah. I think you just can't go back to Phoenix down. Oh, two. Uh, I mean, you could, but then you just got to take our home court. But to me, I think, uh, stealing one in Minnesota in these first two is huge and, and book knows that. So I think we'll get a vintage book game on Tuesday. Okay. So some of the optimistic sunny side out of the way. He had this quote post game, which I think if I was putting my, you know, fan hat on would worry me a bit. He said, we all just need to adjust to the playoff physicality. They're being ultra physical with me. And then I had three early fouls. I went to the bench. Then it was trying to find a rhythm from there. It's just, I don't know. It's like, it's not great to have a team say we need to adjust to playoff physicality when they're supposed to have the experience advantage and kind of the been there attitude here and especially with book i think that physicality is one thing that that we have seen get to him so i know it's just words i know he's just answering a question i'm not trying to jump on him for it but it felt like that watching it and it shouldn't i guess have take it, it sh i think it's fine to hold him to a standard that it shouldn't even take a full game of that for him to be able to adjust against mcdaniels and find ways to to score anyway like he's supposed to be a guy who's the best player in this series potentially, right? Like mm -hmm. Jade McDaniel's a great defender. We've seen, we just saw Jokic put up a, a godly performance against maybe the best defender in the NBA, depending on the night and Anthony Davis. Right. So it's like if <laughs> offense beats defense, most of the time, I guess mm -hmm. it is a little bit frustrating that you said it shouldn't continue into game two, but it's like, well, it did continue after the first quarter all the way through all four quarters. And that's kind of a, an ugly sight too. Yeah, I mean, look, playoff basketball is a different animal, but they knew that going into this game. So hopefully going forward every series, they don't have to wake up game one and, and realize that it's, uh, you know, th the series started because game ones are important. Like, obviously, we've had uh, the Suns have had some success with, you know, the reverse sweep on the Clippers that one year. And just they, they've, they've been able to take beatings in game one and recover and like many several teams have. So it's it's not the end of the world by any means. But at the same time, I, I agree it is a little disappointing that just from a physicality standpoint, they look a little shook. And I just hate when the Suns get caught up in that game where it's just like they're they're just worried too much about the, the officiating. Like, just just play the game. You can't let that get in your head because that's that type of stuff just can really snowball. And, and we saw it happen with the Wolves getting hot and the Suns are complaining to the refs. And uh, just you just can't do that. So, to me, that's, that's the biggest thing is, like, the refs are going to do what they're going to do. You just got to play your game and, and just – control what you can control at this point. And the thing is, right, like it, what bothers me, I think, with some of that stuff is when it's not actually favoring the other team that much, mm -hmm. you know, like Book and Ant basically were neck and neck foul trouble at the same time the whole game. 
And then at the end of the night, you look at the box score, four Minnesota starters had four or more fouls. Conley had five. The free throw discrepancy actually favored the Suns by three, you know? And then you, if you watch the game, you would feel like they were getting the bad side of every single call that happened. And I know some of it is the lack of calls, but look, again, Minnesota had 24 fouls called on them. Suns only had 19. So I think that's part of it is it's like, this isn't really getting called in one direction, you know? And, and Minnesota brings, they're at home and they have a reputation as a good defensive team. The refs are going to give them some leeway to be physical. That, again, like you said, that shouldn't be a surprise, but apparently... It kind of was, and maybe they were underestimating these guys a little bit. I think that part definitely won't happen in Game 2 after they got spanked in Game 1. But on that note, let's talk next about one thing that we are not worried about coming off of Game 1. And then we'll close with what we are worried about. Give you a little bit of sadness to go on your way on this Monday. But that's all coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by Monopoly Go. I've been told I'm a competitive person, and I think we all have a competitive side. But my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on the regular classic Monopoly game where you play instead, though, on not one but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part, again, with that competitive side inside of all of us is messing with your friends, getting a little bit of that bragging rights. You can charge them on rent on your iconic properties, just like Classic Monopoly. Heist their vaults of riches for yourself. And the leaderboards can show you who the biggest tycoon is in the Monopoly world. But it's not just the competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments and earn big rewards, which I think anybody can get behind. So get in the game. Join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Today's show also brought to you by the Game Time app. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets this season. I just bought tickets for May 4th, D-backs Padres. Game Time had the hookup. I love Game Time for a variety of reasons, including a lot of the sales and deals that they do, but as you've heard me say time and again, I'm a stickler. I'm a uh, detail-oriented person, I guess you could say, at least when I'm spending money to go do something fun and I love the seat view. View from your seat. A picture of what you are going to be looking at from the ticket you're buying right there in the app. I used to go to a different website or look elsewhere. Now it's right there within the app along with the all upfront prices and, of course, all the details of the time and date and everything else. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use the code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account. Redeem the code Locked On NBA. For twenty dollars off, download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, Brandon, let's keep it rolling. Give me one thing that you are not worried about. Setting book aside, if that is one of them, which it sounded like it was. We talked about him. What are you not worried about from the several bad things that went wrong for the Suns in Game One? Yeah, to me, it's it was just a com- like a combination of Booker and Beal. Like I. I- I'll focus more on Beal in this this sense because I thought he played he played a solid game. He just kind of played within the the flow of the offense. I thought, and you know, he was six of ten. Uh, only turned him and Book only had two turnovers combined. So to me, it was just more of those two are going to figure it out. They're too good not to. It was just one of those games where I think Minnesota like no one's going to welcome Durant to score. But I mean, there's not too much you can do to stop him. So. They just said, all right, Katie's going to hit tough contested shots over our bigs, like, so be it. Uh, let's cut off Beal and Book. To me, I don't think that's sustainable over a seven-game series. Like, I, I think, especially Beal, I think he, he's due for a big game if they do that again. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing how he bounces back. Uh, obviously, Booker, I think, like I, I just said, as we, we capped off that, I think, uh, you know, he's going to have a historic game, too. Let's just say that. I, I think it's, it's not just going to be like, I, I'm back. I think... Uh, assuming he's at full strength, like this is the type of game that we've seen Book in the past come out with a fire. And I would love to see him send Minnesota fans upset, uh, you know, just and come back to Phoenix 1-1. I just, to me, the star power, like all three of them, there, there's some ups and downs in that game, but I'm not really concerned overall about those guys. Yeah, this is the part, uh, you know, it's like a weekly occurrence where I have to personally address the KD stands who listen to and watch this show, Brandon, who I've adopted as an audience since they uh, since 
Durant was traded here. They think, and I'm I'm speaking directly to all of you, that I didn't that I was overly harsh on Durant, not positive, uh, not hard enough on Booker. Okay, yeah, we've heard that before. But I guess in this case, I'll be more specific, and and you're making my point for me, Brandon. They were the game plan was centered on Durant having opportunities to score. They put their worst defender on him, and they didn't really send doubles and and help that often. In terms of like a full defender coming toward him. And he, he, he hurt them, right? But only one assist. And anytime he did put the ball on the ground, they were swiping, as everybody's done for four straight playoff series, which I mentioned and I think people don't like to hear, but it's a fact. If you don't think that that was written on a whiteboard in the Minnesota practice facility and ingrained in all the heads of the Timberwolves defenders all of last week, you're being delusional. That is the that the book is out. That's what they're going to do, and that's what they're going to continue to do to Durant. To bring some math into this, Beal, who I agree could be a lot more aggressive and things would open up. If you calculate the points per possession on him as a as a score, so that doesn't include the assists. 1.22 points per possession. Durant, despite scoring way more, the turnovers work against him. Only 1.19. Now, both of those are elite. If the Suns scored 1.19 points per possession as a team in this game, that's a 119 offensive rating they would have blown Minnesota out. Booker held them back. We talked about him first for a reason. But those turnovers are damaging. Booker and Beal only had one apiece. So I think Minnesota's game plan did kind of work there. What I would say I'm not worried about is very similar to what you're saying. I'll focus on Nurkic, though, Brandon, which is I'm... I think that they will get back to their bread and butter on offense. And a big part of that is Beal. Another big part of that is Nurkic. And it wasn't even just the Durant or who was handling the ball or whatever, which we all get like way too caught up in. But to me, it was also, they just weren't running their kind of go-to sets, frankly, you know? And you look and Nurkic has one assist. I mean, when's the last time that happened? Unless it was just, you know, book scores 50 type of game or something like that. So... They are just, they're going to need to just get back to the side pick and roll, the dribble handoff stuff, the finding cutters, which I know Minnesota's better at taking away than some teams. But just get back to playing their game on offense, especially early in the first quarter. Try to get some looks that way. I think it'll help Booker. I think it'll help Beal. I think it'll even help Durant and run it through Nurkic, pull Gobert out of the paint. I thought those types of things were going to be such an easy advantage because the Suns have been so good at it lately and it helps poke at what Minnesota's weak weak points might be as a defense and we just didn't see it they just felt kind of shook from the from the beginning frankly in terms of their offensive approach and as much as that should scare you I honestly kind of believe that they'll just be able to settle back in yeah for sure And, and one thing to look for especially just from Minnesota's point of view is like they could take that game plan that they did game one and just completely scrap it and adjust it and what Phoenix is making all these adjustments internally for game two to, to counter that. And this is something we've seen with the Suns in the past where they're like one game behind or they're not prepared for different looks that come like as they happen in real time. That's something I think Vogel and the staff need to be completely on top of. Like Minnesota could, they're very good at junking games up in unique ways. So I think if we're too focused on this is what Minnesota is going to do and like that's what all the adjustments are going to be heading into game two, that could come back to bite them is that they Minnesota could be on an entire different, even though it worked for them. Like that's just, just the type of like mind games and, and looks teams will do to, even if it's just at the start of the game, they, they switch something up and just for a quick edge, like that's just something I think the Suns need to be prepared for because that Minnesota's got some unique ways they can defend with, with those bigs and, and um, Phoenix needs to be ready because for all we know, this, even though it worked, like I said, that's it sounds like counterintuitive in a way, but that's just the way I think you could see teams kind of make those adjustments. So that's just one thing to kind of keep an eye on as well. Yeah, I'm curious to see, right? Like Chris Finch hasn't, he, I guess, was announced as a finalist for Coach of the Year this season. I think he's a well-respected guy, but as, you know, this is the third playoff series for Minnesota, but, you know, he hasn't really been in kind of this super high-level chess match. He's kind of been in the, the underdog spot. Mm-hmm. Two years ago, he didn't even have Gobert. They were really in their first go round last year. It was like, okay, you're playing this juggernaut team. What are you really going to do this year? It's like, all right, you know, you win game one, you're the higher seed. Like you got to be kind of in the driver's seat. You know, I, will he be, I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Gobert was up a little higher than I think we expected him to be in the pick and roll, which is part of why I think, you know, Booker and Beal maybe didn't get quite as comfortable. It might've thrown them off their rhythm. I don't think you go crazy, but if he got into a deeper drop or, you know, if they, what if they go under on some screens instead of going over the way that they were like, even in the pick and roll, I think there's some different things. I doubt they'll change the matchups. Like I don't think cat will suddenly go back to guarding Grayson Allen or Royce O'Neal in this game, but I definitely think how they defend or even on offense, they'll probably be more ready and not take two quarters to snap into to action here like they did in this game. Let's close on a little bit of a down note, but nevertheless important. What are we worried about continuing to be scary? Um, what could the Suns run into again in game two coming up on Tuesday night? We'll get into that next. First, today's show brought to you by Prize Picks. March is over, but the biggest moments of the NBA season are upon us. As you uh, and you can get in on the playoff action, win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Now, win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as few as four correct picks. Turn $10 into 1,000 with basketball, hockey, and beyond. Baseball, of course. Entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one sports fantasy sports app. Prize Picks very simple to play. It's you versus the projections. So you look at what their projections are, you pick more or less, and that's it. No league, no head-to-head, -head, no pool. On top of that, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, an enormous selection of players and stat types all combined to make prize picks the number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today. Use the code LOCKEDONNBA when you make your first deposit to get it matched up to $100. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked in on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, Brandon, I'll kick us off here on what we are worried about lingering into game two. And uh, to me, it starts and ends with Anthony Edwards. I told people, I mean, when we were previewing the series, I said he's going to solve what the Suns throw at him. It's more a matter of how much resistance can you put up in the process and maybe... Could you steal a game while he's figuring it out? And then maybe it's like five, six, and seven. It's just haymakers from both star players on both sides. It didn't take that. It took a half. And uh, what he did in the third quarter, I think, should scare everybody because it wasn't just beating one thing. He beat the Suns' base coverage in the pick and roll. He beat when Eubanks came in and Durant was on him and they were kind of stunting toward him out on the perimeter and he was just patiently waiting on that and bombing pull-up threes over the top of it. And then he was picking his his uh, his enemy and, and just attacking switches against Grayson Allen, which the Suns were giving him a little bit too easily in my opinion, but that's three different things he beat all on the way to a huge explosive explosive quarter to basically end the game. That shows me like everything's on the table and Ant is kind of just going to be this good the rest of the series. And if that's true, it's going to be a lot harder to beat this team. Yeah. I'll go on a limb here and say anytime Ant has a game like that and book and Beal are both sub 20 points, they're, they're going to have a tough time winning. Like I think Ant can go off and the Suns can still win, but it's going to yeah. take more firepower offensively on the Suns end and to match. But that, but that. that is a lot different than what we thought, right? Like this is a mm -hmm. team that was mediocre on offense all year. Yep. So if you're talking about their their defense is going to be a tough t tough thing to break through, and they're going to be have a ceiling on a regular every night basis of a 120. Like I think the Suns will lose the series if that stays true. Yeah, and look, I, this is kind of what I expected game one. Honestly, like first uh, a city like Minnesota, uh, just as hungry as they are for playoff basketball, and like this team, like like players, especially the role players, like you know Reed and and Alexander Walker, like these are guys that were had pretty big games and they're very good capable role players, but role players play better at home. And I think when you have Ant rolling, your, your role players are hitting shots, like the momentum's building, the crowd is into it and games can get away from you real quick. So I think that's, uh, the Suns are built to, to answer. And I think in game two, they will, but it's, uh, it's the margin for error is very thin. Like you said, when Ant's doing that and the Wolves are doing what they can do defensively to, to really limit the Suns big three. So that's, that's a combination that needs to, to end, or at least they have to make uh, 
Anthony Edwards' life a little bit more difficult. And, you know, that's that's just what it comes down to. So, um, what, I guess, was, uh, what was your thing? Yeah, so mine was definitely the rebounding and the size. 13-3 uh, to 3 offensive rebound disparity. I thought uh, the, Minnesota's defense, you can't give that offense – extra looks because you're already going to struggle points are going to come at a premium if you're getting out rebounded i think it's like 53 to 28 or something along those lines and that's just that just can't happen like to me and i think that's a trend that depending on how foul trouble goes and how reluctant vogel is to make certain adjustments or how hungry the team is in general just to get grab a damn rebound like i just don't know uh that's that's probably the, the biggest thing that worries me and like the side note would be uh, Grayson Allen's injury. That's also very some, something that I think could have a huge impact on the series. And um, Kyle Anderson obviously uh, missed the rest of the game for Minnesota too. So that's that's a subplot. But yeah, just going to the big picture stuff. I think that the rebounding size, which we kind of already knew. Um, yeah. You factor in Ant going off, them dominating the glass. Like you're just not going to win games like that. So they got to figure that out ASAP. Yeah, Nurkic just. Weird game. I mean, he missed missed two layups, missed two free throws. We talked about him not really being involved as a playmaker. He somehow gets five stocks. I mean, this like I know Portland fans have known this, and now we're a full season in. He's one of the weirdest players to watch on a nightly basis in the NBA. Like you just you could watch the whole game, and then you look at the box score, and you could somebody could ask you like, "Oh, what did you think of Nurkic tonight?" And I, I sometimes I feel like I don't even have an answer. Or I have like 20 minutes of an answer because it was so insane. But weird one for him. I feel like he needs to uh, just become more involved, you know? I, I think like just whatever it can be, have a mindset to demand the ball and certain not to score. Demand the ball as a playmaker in certain situations. Orchestrate and organize the offense. Fight on the glass, whatever it is. But um yeah, they, that's how I think of it in, in the playoffs, right? It's like the game plan stuff, the execution, everything else, like that's really going to decide the game and, and which players kind of rise to the occasion within that. But it's almost like the possession game is like this. It can either take a competitive game and make it a blowout. It can make a close game, a narrow win for one side. Mm -hmm. It does matter. And it can it can get overlooked. Like uh, the Philadelphia New York game was a perfect perfect example of it, right? Like both star players are bad. Josh Hart hit some threes, okay, sure, but New York dominated the possession game, and that's really why they won that game. The Suns kind of got on the wrong side of that too. So, yeah, and to add to I don't that, know who else it is besides Nurkic. You know, it's kind of it's going to have to be him. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think those outlet passes are huge too. Like this team needs a run. So if Nurkic grabs a rebound, mm -hmm. he needs to be looking up. You can't let Minnesota's offense or defense get set. I think that's how the Suns are going to beat Minnesota is transition offense, generating stops, mm -hmm. keeping that momentum because you just can't let that team get in, that, in their half court defense. Just, I think that's the best way to, to beat them. So that's something I, I think we're going to see a lot more of guys leaking yeah. out, Nurkic hitting them and, and pushing ahead, getting quick shots. That's, that's how the Suns are going to win the series. They're, they're going to win the series by being the better offensive team that gets the stops when they need them. They're not going to play better defense in Minnesota. It's just not going to happen. So that's that's where it starts for me with Nurkic is offensively. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, uh, same number of turnovers. Actually, is that even true? It says that in the team stats on ESPN, but on the box score it says Minnesota had one fewer, whatever. We'll call it the same. Minnesota had four more points off of turnovers. They also had three more fast break points. So that uh that kind of illustrates exactly what you're talking about. So yeah, it's um a lot of people like I know it's just the internet, but even like real discussion about the games and people who cover it in a more serious way. It feels like people are kind of looking at the final score here. This game was close until this the last few minutes of the third quarter, which is what I focused on in my recap. But this was a very kind of throwing punches, different stuff going on for basically, what, 30 minutes? And if you think about it that way, it's not quite as bleak. All right, that'll wrap us up, though. Make sure to check out Brandon's writing throughout the series over at Bright Side of the Sun. They all do great work. I'll be back for one more episode Tuesday morning in your feed, a final preview maybe guessing at some of those game plan adjustments we could even see from the Minnesota side. What can the Suns do? Might watch game one again. Who knows? 
And that'll be that. Post-game recap, of course, on Tuesday night and more throughout the week. Thank you for listening. Hit follow or subscribe to get all those shows and more in your feed all throughout the postseason. And I will talk to you then. Sons and six.